Have you ever opened the back lid or the, the back cover of your phone? Or front, probably? Can you see all the resistors inside? Probably the surface mount resistors or capacitors? They are way smaller than 0603. I think um, the majority of the, the components in your smartphone, probably they are 0201. Somewhere around that, 0201. So the one, So probably this. So we are using 0603 for our PCB. But you know, if you want to make it smaller, you can use 0201. OK. So there's something I need to let you know. Uh, it takes space, and also the area, the space on the silicon chip is super expensive than the space on the PCB board. Uh, you only have normally 1.5 by 1.5 millimeter uh, for the silicon die, and if you want to make it like 4 by 4, the cost will be 100 times more. And you know how much it costs to, to prototype a, for example, 180 nanometer technology and probably just 10 samples or something. It takes tens of thousands of dollars for the silicon die. Just probably 10 samples or 20 samples. Uh, it's pretty hard. It's super expensive. Compared to PCB, $5 for five pieces. And But for IC, <laughs> 20 pieces for 20, probably even $200,000. <laughs> so it's not in the same scale. And um, also takes longer time. Probably, for example, if you fabricate a chip with uh, MOSIS, for example, the ones we have been using, uh, so it's not in a rush. Because if you really, really need something to be done really quickly, then you need to pay even more. For MOSIS, I think they are scheduling the 180 nanometer technology maybe once a month. That's already pretty fast. For the C5, once a year. If you want to make it cheap, it takes a year to receive it. For PCB, three days. And seven days for shipping. <laughs> three days for fabrication. If you add another $50, you can get an overnight fabrication. So you send the design to the company. Next day, you get a PCB already fabricated. So that's a you know, totally different story compared to IC to PCB. So there's something you need to know. Let me open my eagle so I can look at my PCB and let you know the tricks. So the new deadline for homework one has been extended to Friday. So it's been extended again. Uh, so not Monday. The homework assignments for you guys, every one of you, is to revise your PCB to make it ready by Friday. Even though you are done, you think, hey, I'm done. I don't want to touch it anymore since I hate Eagle PCB. You shouldn't hate Eagle because you are going to live with it for the entire semester. So you need to love it. Right? Just think that's your girlfriend, boyfriend. You just want to see Eagle PCB every day. And <clears throat> so be patient. Make it as good as you can. Revise every single detail, even the some of the labels you think is not perfect, go back to the PCB and revise it. Don't mention the uh, solder mask or the other things which are even more critical. Definitely go back and to revise it. Since after I fabricate it, you're, you are going to receive the board. If it's not working, it's not working. Okay. And it takes another 10 days or 20 something dollars to, to fabricate another one. Let's make all the board work. 
If you have any questions for any details about your board, you are not sure if it's working or not, feel free to ask me. Come to the office hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, virtually from 9 to 11. You can also make appointment with me at any time except for the office hours. Uh, just ask me if I'm available. Uh, if I am, I will directly send you a link so we can meet online. So compared to the PCB on the tutorial, the static web page, I made the following changes to this, uh, which are, some of them are minor improvements, some of them are actually critical improvements. Uh, it's not going to affect the functioning or the function of the PCB if you use a version on the static uh, web page, but it's just not perfect. And some of the parts are not actually good practice. So let's revise it. So here's one thing. Since you are revising your PCB anyway, so add a switch. Let me show you how that works. I need to create a new symbol for the switch. You can find the switch in the Spark Funds library. There's, there's an existing symbol which will work for this purpose. So it's not going to be this switch. This is just looks the same as the one I just ordered, because I only have about 20, uh, like 10 or something of these switches, and they are a bit bigger than the one I just ordered. So the one I just ordered about 100 uh, switches, and I have the picture and dimension of that switch at the bottom of the tutorial, so you can scroll down and look at it. So here's the dimension and the pins. So the way this works is it has a button on the top, right? So if you move it to here, it makes the connection between these two nodes. If you move it to here, it makes the connection between these two nodes. If you look at the schematic of this thing, and I uh, so this is covered in the in one of the videos I posted to my to my website. Okay, you can watch the video, see how or where I brought this this symbol to the schematic. So you just need to keep one of the three pins on uh, actually on one side, either side. <clears throat> Not a big deal. Just keep it floating. Floating means it's not being connected to anywhere. So non -con not connecting to anywhere. That's for that pin. And <clears throat> the middle one, you connect it to your uh, circuit. And the, on the other side, that pin short it to the power. So if you move it to here, you connect the power to the middle pin. If you, con if you move it to here, you connect the input to nothing. So your circuit is not powered. Is that clear? You know how to use it now? All right, cool. And you do not need to physically connect everything uh, by wire. If you have used uh, LT Spice, you know that if you want to make a connection, you can change the name of that voltage node, and they will be electrically shorted in the soft software. You don't have to physically draw a wire which can make your schematic looks a lot of mess, okay? So for example here, I just right click and I just change the name. I change the name to power in and it's gonna electrically short this wire to here. Okay, so I do not need to physically wire them up. That's another thing. One more thing, actually a few more actually. So this thing is for the grid setting so look at the grid now, it's pretty big, is it? The way you can change it is, definitely click this push button and change it over here, but you have to do it every time. And there's an easier way to do that in the future, and you have to, I re highly recommend you do that every time, which is you set up 
<coughs> the 0 0.5 and 0 0.05 here in a unit with a unit of millimeter for once. And what you are going to do is click this drop down menu and go to new. But it has to be under that setting, the prefer setting. And then you start a new setting and name it as whatever you like. So in the future, like what I have here, that's my preferred grid setting since I already created it by the way I just mentioned. So I can directly look at the grid right now. It's pretty big now. If I click, it's going to go back to the setting I saved in the memory. So this will be way easier than just go back to here and change it every time. It will save you a lot of time. Is that clear? So there are two settings for the grid. One is the main grid, another one is the alternative grid. So what does that mean? What's this doing here? For example, let me show you. Here's a very good example. So they are all on grid, but let me find one that is not on the grid. For example, this one. Okay, so right on that. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it is on the, on the grid, but just assume it's not, okay? And if I grab a part, for example, this, I have a capacitor, I wanna move it around. Okay, like this. So the two terminals of the capacitor is being snapped to the intersection of the grid, is that clear? If you press out, ALT on the keyboard, it's gonna activate your alternative grid which is 0 0.05 millimeter instead of 0 0.5. So you can move with the smaller steps instead of 0 0.5 millimeter every time. Is that clear? So it's easier to make all the connections. And just in case, for example, I move this guy not to the 0 0.5 grid. You can see it's in the middle. So how can I connect this one to somewhere? What's the trick here? If you don't know the trick, it's going to be super frustrating. And you don't like your girlfriend or boyfriend. You'll probably break up with ego at some point. Since ego is your friend, right? <laughs> I'm trying to brainwash you guys to let you love ego PCB. All right, so it's not snapped to the intersection, right? and you want to connect this point to this wire. Sometimes it can be hard. So do not connect that point to the wire. So connect to where? To the terminal. That'll be way easier. Let's see, if I, mm, you always see this circle, which means it's been selected, even though it's not on the grid. However, if the wire is not on the grid, you won't be able to connect to the wire. You do get the point. So if you directly connect from the wire to here, it can be hard. However, if you want to, so the point is, for example, I'm trying to connect this point to, to this voltage node. If I'm not able to connect to the wire, I will connect to this terminal instead. It's gonna do the same job, it's the same voltage node. So do not try to mess up with the wire if it's not on the grid. Connect to the point, connect to the terminal directly. Okay, that's another trick. And every time you open up a schematic or a layout view, what's the first step? Change the grid to where? To the one you saved. Every time you open up a schematic or layout, do that as a first step. And then do something else. All right, start with design later. Okay, any questions by far? No? All right, a few more things. I found out um, some of the symbols of the capacitors or the dials, the uh, Sharky dial, uh, they are actually available in SparkFun's library. Watch the video, I posted it on my website, so you'll see where to import that symbol, which looks way nicer than the one I drew on my website, and also you drew in your web, in your tutorial.
in your uh, PCB design. So pick up the ones has been uh, designed by Sparfun in their library. So these are the ones I grabbed from, from their library. It looks way nicer than my the past one. Also for the for the inductor. The inductor doesn't have a polarity. So all the inductors have the same symbol. Just use theirs to save time. If you really want to draw your own uh, symbol, go ahead and do it. I'm not against the drawing all the parts by ourselves. Um, okay. Another thing. For the LM2596 power module, the two, the two ones, the 5 volts one and 3.3 volts one, you would like to use a ground, uh, one extra pin connect to the plate. I'm going to show you on the layout, in the layout view pretty soon. So definitely do that. So it is able to short the heat dissipation plate to the ground. Why do we want to short it to the ground? So LM2596 is a power module, right? Is that a power module? What this chip do? So the chip is a voltage regulator, right? And it has a heat dissipation plate on the back. So these are the parts. The LM2596. And you can see actually on the back of this chip, it's nothing but a metal plate. It's, it's a metal plate overall covering the back of this chip. And you know that you need a, a metal pad on the PCB so you can solder this, this chip, the back of the chip on the PCB. And that pad need to be shorted to ground. Why? Yeah, so when you are drawing the polygon, the, up, the polygon outline for the PCB, did you do a rise nest? Did you do a red nest? Red uh, or rest nest? Rest nest, how do you pronounce it? Rest nest, rest nest, right? And you right click that polygon and you change the uh, the polygon's name to what? Just to remember that? Yeah. yeah. And then it does what? It's sure the polygon to a copper and it's going to fill up all the spaces, empty spaces with metal. And that metal is shorted to ground. So why do you need metal everywhere? Copper thread, yeah, and also it's for heat dissipation. So you have a larger area of metal, it's going to dissipate the heat on the board. And for this guy as well, so it does need a back metal to dissipate the heat because this is a power module. All the current is going to run through this power module and supply to the components on the circuit. So it's going to create a lot of heat. Then you need to dissipate the heat. So the back is going to be shorted to ground because the ground has the largest area of metal on the board. If you short that to ground and metal conduct heat, so the heat will be transferred you know, to all, all the metal on the board and reduce the heat um, of the chip to protect it. Is that make, making sense? So the back should be shorted to the ground. Um, so that's something you need to revise. How to make it happen? How to make that happen? First step, change the grid. So you have to ground it uh, to the, yeah, you just, you just have to ground the metal plate. And when you, when you are trying to create this device in your library, let's go back to the library and take a look.
<clears throat> there are some tricks. How do you ground this, this metal pad? Since you are creating another pin. If you need to short it to somewhere, you do need a pin for that. So you can directly grab a pin and place it in the middle of the pad. So you draw this pad using the polygon tool. Here, use this one, right? And pick up the top metal layer. And this is how you draw this plate. It doesn't have to be this shape. You can draw a rectangular shape. This is what this commercial, uh, if you buy the commercial module, not this one, they directly have a rectangular shape on the back of the chip, a uh, heat dissip dissipation pad. Uh, you really don't have to draw something like this. This is recommended in the data sheet, but you really don't have to follow, make the corner like this. And it has to be one piece. If you have two pieces, it's going to create error uh, when you're running DRC. So it has to be one piece polygon for this pad. It doesn't have to uh, be this shape. Uh, that's the thing. But you can see if I draw a polygon, it's just a metal polygon. There's no voltage node. You need to place the pin, put it in the middle. See? You can make it larger, make it smaller. It doesn't matter because it's smaller than, than, the, than the polygon anyway. But you do need a, volt, uh, you do need a voltage node in the middle. So it is able to be shorted to somewhere. And since you create one extra pin for the plate, so in the schematic view of this library, which is the, uh, this one, you have to create one extra pin in the schematic view as well. It, since you added one physical pin for the layout, so you need to have a uh, pin for the schematic. So I name it as plate. And you feel free to just put it like this. And when, whenever you are using this device in your, in your real schematic, you just short it to the ground. That's how you, how you make it work. Is that clear? One more thing. <clears throat> This plate, this metal has to be a bare copper. So it shouldn't be covered by the paint. PCB has paint on the top. Otherwise, the metal will be oxidized by air. And also, it's pretty easily to get shorted if you have all the exposed uh, bare copper wires. So you need a, this paint to help uh, avoiding that. So you need to let the PCB manufacturer know the area that you do not want to uh, apply the paint. So there's another name for the paint, which is solder mask. Okay? So you want to stop the solder mask. And the layer to draw that area is called T-stop, which is going to apply top, stop the solder mask. If you do B-stop, it's going to apply that um, stop layer at the bottom. So Normally, we place all the parts on the top, so don't need to do any B-stop. So just use T-stop to draw that layer. But I, I have drawn that in this device, but you are not seeing that because it's by default, it's being hidden. So go to View, Layer Settings, and scroll down to check this box. So you can see T-stop showing up here. So you can see this area is being covered, so which means this metal will be exposed without being covered by the paint. And you can see the pads. So these are the pads I grabbed from the library from Eagle. So uh, you can see that by default, they already have a solder mask, uh, a T-stop applied to the pad. So that's why you can, you can have the metal pads and solder to the pad instead of solder to the paint. Can you solder to the paint? Can you? Can you? you know, have some solder to attach the paint. Can you apply solder to plastic? Can you apply solder to the paint? It's not just, it's just not going, going there. 
So if you melt the solder, it becomes a liquid solder at tem high temperature. It only goes to the metal because the metal is hot. So, since you can heat it up by your solder arrow or the hot air, so the metal, so the solder will flow to the to the metal plates instead of to the paint. That's how that works. And if it's not flowing really well, you just apply the solder flux to facilitate the flowing of the solder material. That's why I have all these, for example, all these pins, like these three pins, they are pretty far away, but if they are pretty close to each other, I can still make a good connection, so they are not being shorted. It's not really hard. It's pretty simple because the solder, the solder material only goes to the metal, but not the gap in between. But the gap in between is not metal. It's a, it's a paint. And it's not conducting heat, so it's not hot. When it's not hot, it's not going to uh, attract the, the solder. So the solder will be hydro, hydrophobic, like a bowl rolling on the paint. Until it reaches the metal pad, it's gonna stay there. Is that interesting? Like little robot. <laughs> All right. Don't forget to apply the solder mask. No, no, the T stop. Go here. So in the video, I drew the silk screen outline a little bit closer to the uh, solder no, the the T stop block. So I uh, revised it afterwards, after I recorded the video. So you can imagine, you do need an outline outside of the metal, so you know where to place your chip. It's not required, but it's better to have a outline. In which layer? Which layer? Can be a quiz question. Which layer? T place. So what's the T place? Silk screen. Silk screen is a T place, which is a white paint, white color paint for labels. So they, they will, the PCB machine will draw this outline for you so you know in the, within this square, I need to place the chip in here. Okay. Yeah, T stop in the middle. Here's the T stop. Uh, draw a polygon. Here is polygon, and go to T stop. Here. Uh, for this, for this part specifically, if you have another part which requires this kind of uh, barrel copper, not being covered by the paint, you can do it anywhere. Yes, the pads already have it. Because this is from the Eco PCBs library, so they have this already by the designer, and this is your customized part. So, so it doesn't have the T stop. You need to tell uh, Eco or the manufacturer that I I, will, I do need this part to be exposed. Nope. You can, but I'm just lazy. <laughs> because you can even draw a metal plate in this rectangular shape. So what's going to happen is uh, if the rest nest can fill this up by metal, then it's going to do that. Otherwise, it will be just something, nothing, just the board material in this area. It's really not important. You can draw a rectangular shape if you like. Any questions here? No? Clear? Would you revise it? Would you revisit Eagle PCB after? <laughs> yeah, definitely revisit. You have to deal with it for the entire semester. Yeah, never. Anyway. Not saving. Let me see anything else I need to let you know.
the capacitors. If you have pretty thin pads or small pads, make it a little bit bigger. It doesn't have to be the exactly the same size as the layout view in the data sheet. You can see in the capacitors data sheet. <clears throat> I'm going to show you pretty soon when I open up everybody's library uh, website. And same thing as this one. If you look at the if you look at the pins of all these parts, yeah, because it's being wrapped up by the solder, so it looks thicker. Uh, but the pin of every single of this chip is way smaller, probably only 60% of the width of the pad. So it's smaller than that, which is good. So you have more space to, to uh, apply the solder or to heat it up. So do not worry about the size when you are looking at data sheet. You don't have to make it super accurate. You always want to make the pads larger than the pins. As long as they're not being shorted together, make it larger will help soldering in the future. So you can see the pads here are actually a lot bigger than the pins, the same as these ones. So when you are customizing your the, the footprint for your capacitor, make it slightly larger, wider, longer, is uh, only helping, not harming anything. Same as the uh, inductor's pads. Make it bigger. And one more thing here. If you look at the inductors, so when I was drawing the pads, or when you are revising your board, I highly recommend you make the, you know, drag the pad a little bit more outside of the outline. You don't have to solder everything by the solder arrow. You can use a solder paste and put everything on the board and heat it up by the hot wire or hot plate. Then you don't need to, uh, you don't need that extra metal outside of the, uh, of the outline. However, if you do not have a hot air blower and you have to use your solder iron tip to heat up the pad, so you do need some metal outside of the outline, when after you place the part onto the pad, you still have some space to heat it up. If everything is hidden by the part, it's underneath the, underneath the part, you won't be able to heat it up. So the solder will not melt. If you apply some flux, so for example, I started soldering this part. Here's an empty board. For example, this part, okay? <clears throat> it has a pretty, <laughs> the inductor has a pretty large footprint. However, I'm trying to get started. What's the first step? What's the first step to solder this inductor? Flux. So I'm going to use a syringe to apply the flux. So what, what's the flux doing for soldering? So I'm going to repeat this for many times this semester, okay? So you, you guys will be a pro. So the flux is a acidic material, which will etch or erode the oxidized layer on the metal to expose the metal, which will make, make the metal easier attached to the, to the solder. So you have to apply, apply, since you couldn't see the oxidized layer, it can be very, really thin. You have metal here and it's exposed to the air so there will be a very thin oxidized layer on the top, but you couldn't see that. And that will avoid, um, will keep the solder away or being soldered, being attached to the pad. So you plop, apply the flux first. So when the flux is melted, it's gonna, uh, another function is to facilitate the flow of the solder, the liquid solder as well. So it is able to occupy the entire pad if you have the flux. So apply flux first, and then you place this part on the top. Okay, put it here. So where do you apply the solder though? <laughs> it's all covered. How? It's covered. How it's gonna work? 
So in this case, apply a lot of flux. Remember, the flux will facilitate the flow of the liquid solder, right? But you do need for this one. This is not a. You can. You should improve this because I. If I do this again, I'm gonna move these two pads more apart from each other, so I have more metal outside of the outline. So in that case, I will be able to point my solder iron's tip against the metal, so I can heat up this metal plate from the corner here on the side. If I heat it up, since metal can conduct the heat, the entire pad will be heated up by the iron. And then I just need to need to melt the solder wire on the side. Then what? What's going to happen? What's going to happen after that? Since everything is covered, right? You place the part on the top, and you only have this little metal exposed. So what you want to do? You heat it up by a solder. For example, this is an iron tip. Heat it up here. So the entire pad will be heated up, right? And then you point the solder wire against the solder iron, so it's going to be melted, and then what? Will flow inside, underneath the part, because you have a lot of flux. So that's how you solder this part. So the key point is, you need the metal a little bit bigger than, you know, outside of the outline first, and then when you are soldering this part, you need to apply a lot of flux to help the solder flow underneath the part. Is that clear? If you do not want to waste the space on the board, for example, this is a really space sensitive board. It's being used in your smartphone. Every single area, the little area here on the board is expensive. Then you can still have all the paths underneath the part without exposing that outside of the outline. However, you do not want to use the iron tip to solder it anymore. So what you want to use is a solder paste. So I will let you guys uh, try that one as well. It's another version. The solder paste, you just apply the solder paste everywhere on the board and also flux everywhere on the board. Doesn't matter if you have all the solder paste shorting the two pads, which is fine. And you place the, every single part on the board and then place it on the top of the top plate with a hot, with a hot air on the top and blow it, use a hot air. So at the very beginning, you have solder paste shorting these two pads. But after you blow it, what's going to happen? So the solder paste will be melted and flow to where? To the pads. Will the solder paste still stay in the middle to shorter these two pads? To short, short these two pads? No, because the paint in the middle is not hot. And it's not metal. So it's gonna magically, so if you have a, the paste, you can imagine that, what's gonna, what, what that looks like, right? You apply the paste everywhere. But if you blow it, all the solder will be melted and flow to the pads, to the metal pads, instead of staying in the middle. And everything will be soldered to the places it, it needs to be. So that's another version. If you do not have the pads, um, outside of the outline, you can still solder them by using the hot air, the blower. Okay, another thing. So these are the ports. For the schematic, we will know how that works in the future. If you have a board, you receive your board, then how do you use it? Let's go back to the schematic first. I have inputs, outputs. And for this part, for example, if I turn on the switch and power in, so this voltage node will be powered up. And you can see the power in is being shorted to here. So this two, uh, two pin connector is this one on the board. So, which means the input of the voltage regulator is not being shorted to the power in. So I can directly apply a little wire jumper like this. 
So it's being sorted internally. So I just plug into here. Then I enable the 5 volts, 3.3 volts, 1 amp power module because I short it to the power. So now I can use that part, the output from here. So I'm going to have a 5 volts and 3.3 volts for the 1, 1 amp module. Um, you, since I have all the inputs and outputs on one side, so sometimes it can confuse the user a little bit. And also, you can imagine that probably in the future, you can use switches for each one. So do not, uh, you don't have to include a switch in the front over here. You can have a switch here, here, here for the three inputs. If you want to enable one, you just turn it on. That, that, that probably is more user friendly, I think. And <clears throat> so I recommend you to place input and output on two sides of the board. So input on the left, output on the, on the right, like what I did here. So the inputs on the left, <clears throat> output on the right. Um, okay, that's another thing. And also the drill. After you place this drill, where is that drill here? Hole, right? So this default one is too small. So you want to right click and change the size of it. Three means three million uh, millimeters. You can use three or five. Doesn't matter. Shouldn't be too small. If it's too small, we don't have that tiny screw or bolt for you guys to to mount the board somewhere. So have some. Uh, see, like these ones are pretty big. Uh, it's easier to find all these bolts from the market. They are regular ones. <clears throat> um, yeah. After you. So let's do this, okay? Rest nest. I have placed the polygon outside of the PCB dimension. And if I do this, you can imagine it's gonna be poor of copper to the board. So if you have this one, how can you revise your board? How can, how can you return? How can you get back to the previous, huh? Repop. Just type repop there and do repop all. But still not working really well. So what you need to do is actually delete the outline for the rest nest polygon. So the poor the copper will go away. That's the only way you can you can reverse it, reverse it. Uh, I know most of you guys are going to revise it this week. So the first step you want to do is actually delete all these lines. So this is the bottom line, the bottom of polygon, and also the top polygon. You just need to delete both of them. See, this, uh, this is another one. This is the top polygon. Okay, here is already deleted. And check this one. Deleted already. Okay, so they are all deleted, top and bottom. So you can save it and revise whatever you need to, to revise, okay? and auto route it later. Uh, when you have some updates for the parts in the library, you have to go back to the schematic to reload that part, back to the schematic, and then create uh, uh, create the PCB layout from, from there. But you do not have to uh, re create a PCB file at all, because you have placed all the parts here already, it takes time, I understand. So if you only need to revise or replace this guy, just replace this guy. You just need to go back to schematic and delete, delete this one and reload it from the library to pick up the one you just uh, revised, updated, and place it back to schematic, and then convert it back to the PCB view, and you'll be able to who have a uh, the updated version instead of the older version.
Okay. I think that's everything I want to cover before I get into the PCB websites you have. Any other questions? So there might be some other minor issues specifically for every every one of you. I think it's good to learn from, from each other. Oh yeah, good question, thanks. So Gerber file, let's do that. <clears throat> you need to send your Gerber file to me by email. Um, you can upload your Z file to your website as well, but if you want to send it to send it to my email to keep that privacy so other people is not copying your design, uh, send it to my email and I will upload it for you to my uh, PCB PCB way account. So you are not doing doing this by yourself because I'm paying your PCB fabrication, right? So send the Gerber file to me. So how do you create a Gerber file? There's one one thing is pretty important. I think I have this on the on the website. Uh, uh, yeah, let's let's go to the website since it's more clear over there. So after you create a Gerber file, you are going to have three folders in that folder, and you want to go to the drill file folder and copy that drill file to this Gerber files folder because the drill file is required. The drill file defines all the drills on the PCB, not just the holes on the, in the four, at the four corners, but also all the vias with running the traces to the back of the PCB. So you need to include this one into here, and I will select, I will just highlight or select all the files and right click and using 7-zip or any other zip, zip uh, apps to create a zip folder like this. And you do, you really want to rename it. You name it whatever, probably just using your Fuller's College account. Just rename it using your name so I know that one belongs to you. And I'm going to upload. So what I will do is go to PCB way. I'll directly upload this zip file you sent to me to there. And before you do that, make sure you check your PCB file layout or actually the Gerber file on this website. So create the account if you need to, and definitely not just checking the silk screen, silk, silk screen because the silk screen shows all the labels. Since I, I, I did this one because I really want to know I have labels for every pin. You can imagine if you got a board and you don't know which one is for which, it's not user friendly. You need labels for every header. That's one thing. And also you want to check solder mask as well. So if you check solder mask, you'll see if your the ground plate of the LM2596 is exposed. So it's not being covered by the pin. So check these ones. Because after Friday, I'm not going to accept any Gerber files to fabricate the PCB for you. So make sure everything is correct by, by, by Friday. Um, did I answer a question? Still have uh, three minutes. That's three minutes. Okay, two minutes now. So let's do that. And there are some major issues, I think, if there are some. <clears throat> um, so that's a metal. Oh, no, wait, let's take a look. So here, this is all line. It shouldn't be a metal layer. I think the right color is top metal. So for the capacitor, you only need these two pins to be metal, but not this one. And I don't know if there is a solder mask, uh, uh, the T-stop applied to this plate. If not, go ahead and re uh, revise it. And also this plate, this should be a metal plate, not a, not a metal line. It should be a polygon. Uh, and definitely short this polygon to ground later. Um, it looks pretty actually, but just uh, revise all these things and add a switch and also place the input to the left, output to the right. All these major things. Uh, same here, I don't think you have a, a T-stop and it doesn't have to be this specific shape. You can directly draw a rectangular shape and add another pin and change this 
uh, symbol using smart fund symbol. Um, so see, this is not this is not oh this is grounded, which is great. Um, and make the pins for the capacitor a bit larger since you can see it's super thin. It's harder. It's pretty hard to, to solder to it. Make it thicker, wider. And also show the show different uh, views like the silk screen, the sort of mask, and everything. Uh, guarantee is correct. Add a switch. Change the symbols. Um, I think the pin is too small. Yeah, they are too too narrow. Make it wider. And I don't think this is uh, I don't think this this style is correct. Uh, it should should follow follow the one I have on my on, in my tutorial. So use the wider one. This is too small. So the doubt I have is a little bit wider than this. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think you know what's going on here. So there are two two figures are missing at the bottom of the white page. Just fix it later. Um, I think there are there's a question about this design. <clears throat> I don't know what is this one. Is that a header surface mount header? So yeah. I don't have that part, and you can use you can use it. I can order that for you. But uh, these headers are more common. But this is fine if you want to use it. Um, and also for the rectangular shape. So sometimes if you have a square shape, they are, I think they are calculating the, the uh, size for each edge of the shape. So for example, you have this one, it's not, they are not calculating the cost for this part, but if this is too long, it's gonna increase the cost. But I don't think this size will increase the cost anyway, because it's, it's not too big at, at all. But just keep this in mind. Uh, if you can make a square, make a square, which is can be a cost more cost uh, efficient. Uh, I don't have time to go through everyone, but if you have questions, let me know. Uh, or if you want me to go through your PCB individually, uh, I can do that as well. I have Arduino kits. I think I already gave the kits to the to group two. In group one, if you don't have a kit, grab it because we have a so homework two is still where actually September the sixteenth. So the Wednesday is a week after next week. So you have time to to work on that. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take it. Thanks.